The Variety Artist, episode 30. This one's all about innovation and puppetry. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your phone or mobile device. It really helps me a lot. On this interview, we talk about a lot of things, but one of the things we talk about is CACS. It's the Conference of Variety Family Performers. It's being held January 23rd through January 26th, and I'll be there. If you see me, make sure to stop by and say hi. I love meeting other variety artists. My guest today will be there too. You'll be able to meet him also. All right, let's get on with the interview. Today's podcast is brought to you by audible.com. They're offering you, the Variety Artist, a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at thevarietyartist.com slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book right after this podcast and get your free audiobook. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. My guest today is the president and creative director of Axtell Expressions. His creativity has helped him create puppets, animatronics, and even AI, Axtell Intelligence characters for entertainers all over the world. He co-hosts CAX, the conference of variety performers every year. Heck, his name is in the name of the conference. Variety artists, I give you Steve Axtell. Hello, John. Thank you. How's it going, Steve? Really great. Good. You know, I've, I've had a few of these podcasts. I had Becky Goodyear on, Peter Norgard, and Mark Merchant. Oh, yeah. All of them use your products, and they said, you have to get Steve on. You have to get Steve on. Oh, cool. So here you are. Well, I am in the flesh. <laughs> so tell us, when you're not doing your business and making your puppets and all of that, what do you do kind of in your personal life? My Susie, my wife, and I have uh, just done a, a lot of remodeling at the house. We love working in the yard. We kayak, and uh, she keeps me in shape. She's a fitness instructor, so what little shape there is to me, it's hers. <laughs> <laughs> She's a fitness instructor. Now, you guys have been married for... We've been married, yeah. Next year will be 40. 40? 40 years, yeah. <laughs> so what's the secret to uh, a long-lasting marriage? Um, well, we, she, she's my vice president in the company and we work together, uh, well, but boy, I tell you, it's, we're best friends. That's always the case, you know? And do your kids work in the business too? They have growing up, but each one of them have, uh, learned that, uh, they can do anything they want because dad did. And so they've all taken off in their own, uh, incredible fields. My oldest son is a songwriter, singer, worship leader. Uh, my daughter, Jessica, and that was Ryan. And my daughter, Jessica, is a fine artist. She's licensed mm. as an artist with Penny Lane. Tyler is in uh, San Diego with an incredible leather goods business called Bradley Mountain. And they make uh, like $400 backpacks and incredible wow. work down there. And then my daughter, Melody, is a track coach here at our local college. So they've all done their own thing, and they're out there in the world doing it, kicking it. Well, I appreciate that. I've taught my kids the same thing. And nowadays, there's no reason not to do what you love to do, not do what you want to do. With the internet, the information is out there. It's accessible. Absolutely. And it's different than it used to be 20 years ago when you, know, you had to be a doctor. Your parents wanted you to be a doctor or carpenter or something like that. I've just always uh, inspired them to chase their dreams as, as I've been so inspired by so many people in my life. Yeah, me too. Well, let's talk about some of that inspiration. I was reading on your website, Craig Lovick yeah. was important to you. Who is that? Craig Lovick was um, a man who came into my life when I was early married in about 21, 22. The great story about Craig is, and I didn't know this, but when I was a child, a friend of mine who was a ventriloquist gave me a little flyer, and the flyer just had some dummies on one side, and on the other side, it had some latex puppets, and it was a mayor workshop, but there was no contact information on it because it was probably in a, a mailing that had the information on another uh, leaflet or some catalog. 
this little thing, this little piece of paper was my inspiration growing up, part of my inspiration, there were many others, but I would sleep with this even folded up under my pillow as a kid. And then later, when I was early married, Susie and I were in a new city. We had just moved to uh, Tascadero, California. Oh, yeah. Um, I was working in, the, in mental health at the time at the state hospital there, and Susie was going to Cal Poly University. We, it was one weekend, and I, I just, we wanted to find a church there. So I put my finger in the phone book and said, let's go here just for fun. So yeah. we go, and it's a strange little preschool building. And so we go in. We're all sitting on little preschool chairs. <laughs> it was bizarre. And then this, after the service was over, we go, okay, we'll try a different one next week. <laughs> yeah. This guy walks up to me and goes, hey, would you like to come to lunch with us? So, sure, why not? You know, I yeah. turned down a free lunch. So we went over to their house, and, and we're just talking. And he asked me what I do. And I told him I worked at the state hospital, but I really – had a passion for puppets and magic and I was performing on the weekends and he goes, Oh, and I said, what do you do? And he goes, well, come here, I'll show you. We walked down the hallway. He opens up a, one of his bedroom doors, which was a studio. And I walk into all the characters that were on that little leaflet that somebody had given me. Oh. He is the man that made those dummies and was part of mayor studios. Mayor workshop was what he called him his own business. And famous uh, puppets and dummies that are still part of the, the history of ventriloquism. So when you walk down that hall and you open that door and you saw what you saw on the flyer, was that a strange experience? Man, it was out of body. I could not believe it. It was stunned and it was like I could hear angels singing. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, it was incredible. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I looked and I'm and looking at him and I'm thinking of the serendipity of this moment. How in the world could this happen? Because literally he, I didn't even know him and his work had inspired me all through my puppet building years and, and sure. all of that. So it was great. And we became good friends and he kind of taught me the ropes of the ventriloquist market, I'll say, and how to get started in business and taught me the ropes. It was a really good mentor. Was that the first moment you said, I think I can probably do this for a living? No. No. So before, he, he actually came along at the time when I was ready for it to be a real business. So I, was, I had been inspired to do this as my lifelong passion when I was uh, much younger. I saw Kukla, Fran, and Ollie when I was six years old on the TV. Oh. I don't know if you remember that, black and white. Oh, I do. I do, as a matter of fact. And I tell you, it was so cool. Those characters were just so fun. But it was early puppetry. And as I was inspired by it, I started making, I asked my mom, I was six years old. I said, I want to make a puppet. So she said, well, if you're going to make a puppet, I want you to learn how to use scissors and how to sew. So she had me cut out this really crude puppet that you can see on my website. I've got it in my, if you ever come to the studio, John, I'd love to show it to you in person. It's really uh, one of my great keepsakes. I'd love to see that. In fact, I'm coming, coming to CAX ah, in January, which we'll, we'll talk a lot okay. more about. Awesome. But I'd love to see it. So she had me, uh, helped me to make this little puppet. And then as I grew up making puppets, I saw uh, Sesame Street for the first time when I was 14. And that really changed my life because I saw characters that were no longer sticking out of windows like Hook Look Friend and Ollie, but they were walking around on the streets and they were walking around, uh, you know, chest shots and things uh, going in and out of doorways and just like they were actors. And that right. was the magic of television, which totally inspired me. So I took my efforts to making what, what kids do is to copy things. And so I started making Kermit and Oscar and I was uh, building Steve's Muppets, you know, just... <laughs> in innocently copying Jim Henson's work. And sure. so my mom, and I was in the newspaper prodigy kid, you know, it was high school, all that stuff. They, there was this newspaper article that my mom cut out and sent to uh, uh, Henson Associates in New York 
she was hoping that they would see, you know, some talent. I'd be able to work for them because where else is this kid going to get to work? <laughs> yeah. And at the time they were the only Sesame street was the big one that was doing it. it right. It's transformed everything. Yeah. The Muppets just transformed television puppetry and Sesame street was my first exposure to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't see Sam and friends and I didn't see the Saturday night live stuff that they were, but I saw Sesame street. So they wrote back to me and I have this letter. Don't use the name Muppets. That's, you know, trademark and, and don't copy our characters, but find your own characters. You have a lot of talent, Steve, and you should meet other puppeteers that, that are in guilds. And they told me about the puppeteers of America and, and uh, you need to really find yourself. And, and as a designer, that's where you'll really grow is to find your own look and stuff. So I thought I had offended Jim Henson. And, and so I felt horrible at, as 14. I promised <laughs> myself that I would never copy. Um, that became my mantra and began to develop my own characters. That's where I knew that I wanted to do this you know, as a business. So okay. to finish that story out, I want to fast forward to a few years ago. I'm sitting in my office and I get a call from Lewis Mitchell from Sesame Street. Okay. And he says, Steve, I'm a producer at Sesame Street and we want you to know how much you inspire us. <sighs> and I said, what? And he said, we watch your videos every day. We really are excited about your platypus song and have some ideas for it. And, and uh, we began to talk and be, became friends. And he said, and he sent me this poster that was signed by all the Muppeteers, all the uh, puppeteers oh. that work at the Muppets and just an incredible connection. It came full circle. They inspired me. I inspire them. And it's just the way it goes as we age, I think. So you didn't even know this was going on when they were watching your videos and things? Not at all. No. And, and I think, you know, there's 200 or so videos that I have on YouTube and they're available to everybody. And so I know I've been told by Disney Imagineers, you know, that they watch my stuff and it's just, so it's out there and, and it's just, you just never know who's, who you're inspiring. It's really great. Yeah. Are those videos of the process of you putting together puppets or what, what, what are on those videos? Most of them are promoting a, a character. So I'll, I'll come up with a platypus and then I'll put out a platypus song and then I'll put that on YouTube so that people know how it moves, what it looks like, and then where they, where they can buy it. Gotcha. In that case, the platypus video has now gone viral. It's up to 4 million or so views. Oh, have you monetized that? Yes. Yes, that's been very good for us. <laughs> I would think so. <laughs> little side money. I would recommend that to anybody, actually, in our field, since we're all entertainers. You know, there are, there are some really wonderful moments that you can capture in your shows or interacting with kids. And some of those, as, as a lot of you, your listeners know, those can go viral. And, and when they do, if you monetize it, you're getting some good side money there from Google. And you never know what can hit either. No. I interviewed Doug Shear, who's the school assembly guy yeah. and, and was terrific, terrific entertainer. His son put up a video of him doing, you know, those old claw machines where the, the claw comes down yes. and you grab a stuff. He, he's a young kid and he puts up on YouTube uh, him doing the claw machine. It starts getting a bunch of hits. He starts doing it over and over. And now he has hundreds and thousands <laughs> of subscribers and he's making money on YouTube doing the claw machine. Well, it's so cool because, and it's, it's legit money. Um, they're getting, uh, it's clickbait, you know, so they're getting, yeah. they're using your videos to monetize to people to click through on those ads. And it's, uh, it's worth it to them to send you money. And why not? Why not? All right. Now let's talk about Anthony. Is it Boulogne? And why was he important to you? Tony Boulogne. He is an incredible artist, craftsman. He made the very first Barbie doll. Mm. He made the little green army men that we played with as kids. Yep. I had a set. Yep. I took a mold making class from him. He had a mold making class and I was in the process of learning all this uh, craft and getting better at it. So I took his class. We became instant friends and he had a, a wonderful shop and sold his molds for the ceramic industry mostly and figurines and things. Anyway, eventually he ended up working for me 
uh, on a contract basis and doing some sculpting work for me, continued to make molds with us, and now is retired in Idaho. So are some of your characters created by him yes. or are they all created by you? Well, they're all, they're all my designs, but uh, over the years had several different artists, uh, sculptors working with me because there's just too much work. So I do most of the sculpting. I probably have done 90% of it. I've had maybe three or four other sculptors that have helped me with different characters. Well, tell me about the early days of Axtell. What brought you from that 14-year-old kid putting together puppets and yeah. such to actually creating a business out of it? That's a, a great um, question because it's a, a convoluted you know, road as things get started. And you know, how do you go full-time with something like this? Uh, yeah. When I got married, I, I was working in psychology and I worked at Camarillo State Hospital and a Tascadero State Hospital as a psych tech. And that's a level of care position where I'm on the front lines. I was working at Camarillo. I was working with autistic children. Ooh. I used puppetry in that as well. Even though it wasn't part of the job description, I would bring those in and found out that it was a tremendous use of therapy. Yeah. And with autistic, it's incredible. And so then in a Tascadero, that's a high level uh, mentally disordered sex offenders and a whole different, <laughs> a whole different vibe altogether. Uh, very stressful work, actually. It was uh, something that I, I did for the last three years of that work. I, I had eight years total uh, working in psychology. And then while I was up there, I actually started a class in puppetry and in puppet making with these clients we did some very interesting work that the psychologists used as diagnostics. So we would bring them through the process of building a puppet of their choice of any character that they wanted to make. And that was part diagnostic right there. What did they build and why did they build it? So I wasn't involved in analyzing that. The, the psychologists did that. In some cases, like a client that maybe was a rapist, actually built a woman truck driver and, and he talked about his mother a lot in that situation. So it was very interesting diagnostic tools. And then we would do videos where we would do stream of consciousness, just videotaping and ad libbing routines. So these characters would be talking to each other on video for them. It was therapeutic. They worked through some stuff and the psychologists use it as diagnostic. Anyway, I got out of that work as soon as possible and <laughs> I found myself transitioning. I was performing still on the weekends as a, as a magician puppeteer. I was actually not a ventriloquist at the time. Mm. I had a puppet stage and I would uh, do magic and then I would do uh, puppets as some relief from the magic. Yeah. I was uh, selling puppets on the side. People were buying my puppets, seeing my shows and I had some inventions. Uh, my bird arm illusion was the first one. That is a fake arm that allows your puppet to sit on your arm and look like it's, it's just alive on your arm. Still very, very popular. Yeah, yeah it is. But that was kind of the start of all that. And I was getting to a point where I knew I had to get out of this intense work uh, in psychology. I wanted to get into the more creative side of life. My wife said she was graduating at the time and she said, let's start a business. What do you think about making puppets so that you don't have to travel like so many of these other entertainers are having to do. So I had a choice. So if I was going to be an entertainer, you know, I'd be on cruise ships or I'd be in Vegas or I'd be doing something, whatever I do, I try to do big. So I would have tried to pursue all of those avenues or television or something. Yeah. It was not the family life that we wanted to have. So she said, what if you don't do that? What we have a business and you make puppets. And then I think that was the brilliance of marrying Susie because uh, one of the many points, but she um, had she nothing to do with being madly in love with her. No, no. it had to do with her business sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she, it was a side benefit that she's just absolutely gorgeous. So <laughs> but, it does help. But I tell you, it, it was, What's brilliant about it is that I'm now able to make families and children all over the world extremely happy through my work of 
allowing my products to go out through other entertainers. Yeah, it, it multiplies it exactly. exponentially. Mm -hmm. I could have never touched that many people. So it, this, is, uh, this is really great. And every single day I get letters and pictures and stuff from performers all over the world. And, and we're, we're in 80 countries. Well, how did Axtell Television or Ax Television come about? Interesting. So we decided that television was where we wanted to be. So being so inspired by uh, the Muppets and Sesame Street and everything, we decided we wanted to do something. And at the time, the, the cool stuff was Bill Nye, the science guy. That was, that was the time. It was, it was the early 90s. But that was cool. I loved Bill Nye, the science guy. And that edgy cutting, all that editing, and, and the way stuff was presented, I actually had a tremendous uh, ride in the 90s with VeggieTales as well. Oh, did you work with VeggieTales? I or? did, yeah. I had the license for uh, the VeggieTale puppets. So ah. I joined them, and that, be, that was a huge thing. So we, we manufactured the puppets for VeggieTales, and we're involved with some companies that came along on that ride with me to distribute and funded a studio for us. So we were able to start a studio in Ventura that was the largest studio in Ventura besides the cable company. Mm. So yeah, that was pretty sweet. So we, we started to produce X television. And in the process of doing that, we had the interest of Disney home entertainment, the family channel, Nickelodeon. We had interest from all of these people as we developed this show and we put it together on a shoestring budget, but we had a very big investment in our studio equipment and, and all of the things we put together, the show that you can see on uh, YouTube. Now we only made the one pilot episode and then nine 11 happened. Oh, and that rocked everybody's world. Yep. A lot of people I've interviewed have talked about their performing career or if they produce something and nine 11 is always a big topic. Isn't that something? Yeah. It just, it truly did. It rocked our world. All of us. Yeah. That took the bottom out of everything. So we tried struggling along on our own for a couple of years and we decided we can't do it on our own. We need a, we need major production behind it mm -hmm. to keep it going, mm -hmm. which would have been a great show. We uh, shut down the studio and we got back to business as, as puppet builders. And when did you start doing the animatronics? How did that all come about? I got a call in 2007 from an animatronics guy that had a, a robotics company in Dallas, Texas, but had retired from it because he had cancer. He took five years off and he had a five-year non-compete clause with the company he sold to. And I did not know him. His name was Ron Palmer. He had a, a company in Dallas building robots that a lot of police and firemen use to go around to schools. And you may have seen some of these in little cars and trucks and fire engines. Okay. They would go around and the operator would have a microphone and remote control and, and they would go around and entertain and talk about fire safety and stuff. Okay. So that was a company I had seen his work, but didn't know him. He said, I've moved here to California because I want to be near the best puppet makers in the world. And that's you. Oh. And I want to come and I want to visit you and see if maybe I could start buying your puppets and turning them into robots. Yeah. Well, I had already had that on my goals list because I, I'm, I'm a huge journaler. And so I've got goal, uh, daily goals. I'm flipping through the one even right now that, of course, my to-do list says 10 o'clock interview with you. Yes but right up to the minute, you know, for all of my 36 years in business, I have them from day one. Oh. I've got a big collection of the notebooks. But anyway, he called me. I had done a few animatronics of my own for custom for people with my characters. And I knew that I wanted to do it, but we didn't have the infrastructure or the talent inside the company at this point to do it. So I saw this opportunity and I said, well, Ron, Instead of that, why don't we have you join us and we sell the animatronics because I've got this huge market of performers. Yeah. That's what happened. So he, he came and joined us for a couple of years 
And then he ended up dying of a heart attack oh, no. from the medications that he was taking for his cancer. So it was just a really sad, sad thing. And I had to scramble to put a team together to replace what Ron had done. But we had to, in 2008, if you look back at the Magic Cafe, yeah. one of their longest threads was about my animatronics launching. So on the night that we released them in 2008, Wally came out. That was, we picked Wally because Wally the movie. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a robot. Yeah. So we picked that night and we released them on our website and 27 countries cool. made purchases that night ah. of our animatronics. Everybody was baited and waiting for it. Uh, you, you said, I think I might have something here. Might be. It might be of interest to these <laughs> yeah. magicians to finally get something of Disney quality in their shows. And that's what we tried to do is to put tiki room on a stick kind of a thing. And for magicians, it's great too, because if, if you're not a ventriloquist, and I don't have that talent, if yeah. something is talking without me doing anything, it's an advantage to my show. Exactly. And adding another character to a magician's show is an intense idea. It's multiplied in many cases, what performers can do to present their shows, to present themselves. Barry Mitchell recently has been writing articles and things about this, watching what happened when he added one of my characters to his show. Now he's added a second one. It was first a turtle. Now he's added a chicken mm -hmm. and it's just exploded. I mean, his business has multiplied and his celebrity power has multiplied. So now it's not only Barry as the celebrity, but it's this chicken, it's this turtle. And that makes advertising stronger because the pictures show characters. Yeah. And then the kids want to see that character again. Oh, it's just, it's powerful. It makes your show huge. I was talking to Becky Goodyear, who does fairs and festivals around the country. On her promo is a picture of Virgil, who's one of your characters. Absolutely. Animatronic. Is, is that the name? That you yes, and he's animatronic, yeah. Okay, but she does a whole routine with him and uses it not only during the show, which makes the show bigger because it's more than one person, a one-man show. It now looks like you know two people or two characters, yeah. uh, but she also uses it for promotion, and it looks terrific. Oh, thank you, yeah. She's done a fantastic job incorporating him. This is the old, uh, we call him the, old, the world's oldest man. Okay. And it's her Virgil. You know, it just takes their shows to another level, so... Animatronics over puppets is nice for a magician because they, their hands are free. Right, and, and Becky's not a, not a magician. She's a balloon artist. There you go. So your characters can be used not only by magicians, balloon artists, but anybody in that field. Yeah. And as balloon artists, uh, we also have a talking animatronic uh, balloon structure mm. that you can twist balloons over and make the balloon character talk. Now, let's get into the newest thing, or at least the newest thing that I've seen, the AI. Yeah. You recently did the Frizzle Chicken Family Restaurant in Pigeon Forge. Yeah, the Frizzle Chicken Farmhouse Cafe. It's, a, it's actually a, a, rest, a breakfast restaurant is what it started out as the Frizzle Chicken Pancake Coop, but they soon learned after they invested so much that they need to be open breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they changed the name recently. It's all beta testing right now on their first one. Eventually, I think they're going to franchise this thing and it's going to be huge. Uh, this is David Fee in Pigeon Forge and he's a, he used to be a magician, in fact, uh, on cruise ships. And he and his partner, Jim Hedrick, he was a juggler and they met on cruise ships, I think, and they worked together. And they, they partnered and became producers of shows. So they have the big comedy barn there, and they've got the Hatfield and McCoy Dinner Theater. Mm -hmm. So they have a, a bunch of different things like Smoky Mountain Opry and stuff. And then they've got this new one, which is the Frizzle Chicken Farmhouse Cafe. And we've developed a hundred animatronic, over a hundred animatronic chickens for their restaurant. Every 15 minutes or so, they'll, they'll start and they start singing, you know, like Let It Go or Uptown Funk or all these fun songs, that, pop songs in chicken voice. Yeah. So you can see videos on, on my Facebook page. or Those are website. cute, but I'll tell you the most fascinating thing for me are the chickens that you can talk to. Yeah, that's the AI. How does that, so, uh, I won't ask how that works. Well, I probably will ask how it works, but <laughs> <laughs> it is fascinating to me because people are just asking random questions and it's, it's answering yes. random yes. answers. People literally think there's an operator somewhere doing it. 
because we've worked in that field for a long time, we know how people talk to puppet characters or animated characters. We know what they say. We know also we've studied conversations. We've had to go into quite a bit of research. We've been in, involved in this for over a year now, but it's really new. We're using speech recognition on the front end. Oh, It's all at cloud-based. And then our programming that we're doing is taking the triggers from the speech recognition and putting it through our software into a response. And the response that we're using is not a synthetic voice. We don't like the Siri approach. I've actually gone there. I've recorded my voice in character with two of the biggest companies in the world, one in India, one in England. They created the synthetic voice for me of my characters, but I don't like them at all. They sound very robotic. Mm. You just don't put strings of words together very well yet. It's not there yet. So I've pre-recorded the voices organically so that their responses sound very real, just like our animatronics or just like a puppet character would sound like talking. Yeah, they sound like the character. I guess there would be nothing worse than a chicken saying, saying, yes, the booth is over there. Exactly. Or throwing it to, well, Google says or Wikipedia says, it's like the Siri answers. We don't do any of that. So what we're doing is specifically crafting it for the place that's being used. They're usually custom. For example, just the chicken, let's just take. Yeah. We're doing other characters. But as the chicken, we have a generic library of replies. And then we have a custom library of replies for the individual, like in this case, the frizzle chicken. Mm-hmm farmhouse cafe. So if you, you ask it, uh, what do you eat? Well, I really like pancakes. <laughs> and so, and what kind of, what do you like on your pancakes? Well, the chef here at the frizzle, oh, he likes to put chocolate chips on it for me. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's like, there's another person in the room with you there. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. There's many people in this room. <laughs> well, just, there's just a bunch of people in your head. You just let them yeah. out occasionally. Yeah, the character, exactly. <laughs> yeah, characters are all over me. <laughs> That's AI. Let's talk about CAX. Because CAX, I didn't even realize this until, uh, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. CAX is a combination of Cadabra and Axtell, right? Yes, that's the AX. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. Do I sound silly because I didn't re- recognize that? No, I mean, it's, a, it's an odd word, CAX, and it's, it's good for marketing because it, what was Yahoo before, you know. So CAX is something that you can remember very well. It's Cadabra, who, of course, you all know, which happens in August in Tennessee. By the way, we were just there in August, and everybody from the conference came over to the Frizzled Chicken Farmhouse Cafe, which is in Pigeon Forge, the same city. Oh, we all got to see the chickens together and talk to the AI during Cadabra. That was really fascinating. Oh, wait, did you get to talk to the chicken in your chicken voice, talking to the chicken in your chicken voice? (laughs) Well, I have done that before. (laughs) I'd like to see video of that. That's pretty bizarre. I'll have to try that. I'll have to shoot that. So what is CAX then? So Cadabra is in, in Tennessee, and that's the International Kids Show Conference. They joined with me to have a West Coast one since I'm out here in California. Cadabra and Axtell joined forces together to co-host this conference, which used to be here, and we would take tours, I say here in Ventura County, and we would take tours from the conference to my shop, through my shop, to see where all the puppets and magic is made right here at Axtell Expressions. Mm. And that's the tie-in. And now we've moved it to LA because it's closer to the airport because we're getting a lot of international guests. Yeah. So it's now in LA, it's still here and we still do the bus tour up here to my studio in Ventura. So if they register for CAX, if someone listening to this registers for CAX, they'll actually get to see your studio? Yes, there's a tour day and you have to sign up for it. And you can go to cadabra.com, K-I-D-A-B-R-A, oh, .org, sorry, cadabra.org. And there's a CAX link there to it. And it's going to be this year, 2019, it'll be January 23rd to the 26th. Okay. And a lot of people come to it from all over the world and it would be great. We're going to see you there. Yes. You're going to see me there in late January. Now, if you sign up for the tour, they get the tour. And then what else uh, is available at CAX? We've got all kinds of performers that are coming in. Jay Johnson, the ventriloquist, will be there. Colin Diamond, 
will be there from England teaching puppetry. Jay always has something quite amazing to do. Mallory Lewis, this is the puppet people that are coming. Mallory Lewis is Sherry Lewis's daughter, and she'll have Lamb Chop there performing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ken Scott, the magician, yep. will be there. He's incredible. Barry Mitchell, with uh, we talked about him a little bit, but his creativity and innovation explodes at CAX. Uh, Yasu Ishida mm-hmm. will be doing origami. It, it crosses a lot of boundaries. So we we get uh, Scott Green and Annie, Banani and Buster. Yep. Balloon. There's balloon twisters there. There's jugglers. We cross the whole kids show performing area. It's not just puppets. There's a good puppet imp- infrastructure, though, because of my connection with the conference. Right. So if you're involved in any sort of variety art with children, uh, that would be the place to go. Absolutely. What are the dates on that again? It's January 23rd to the 26th. Perfect. All right, we're going to move into uh, the variety artist's favorite game, fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun? All right. Here we go. Is it fact? Or is it something John just made up? Ah. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to read a headline, and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little bit more about it. Okay. Here we go. First headline. Steve was yelled at by Chuck Berry. The famous Chuck Berry. True. <laughs> oh, and when, when and how did that happen? He's doing a um, national tour. And he needed a local band to back him up when he came to when I was up at Atascadero, California. I'm playing in a band. I keep keyboard player in a rock band. He, wait, wait, wait. Keyboard player in a rock band? Yeah. <laughs> so wait. I should have told you that I do that on the side. I have a lot of different lives. Wait, you do that now? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's a whole <laughs> Okay, this is going to be a 12-hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're opening for Chuck Berry? Are you working with, what is it? I'm uh, backing up Chuck Berry at a concert. He's uh, playing along, and of course, he turns to me and yells, hit it, boy. <laughs> so I was called boy by Chuck Berry. I love it. I'm boy and hit it, boy. So I got my keyboard solo, and I'm rocking out. And so that's when he yelled at me. And then another time was like, that's not the key we're in. <laughs> <laughs> he changed keys on us. Oh, man. Which he's kind of famous for. You know, he'd, he'd always try to throw off the band. So. <laughs> Just great. It was it was incredible. Clearly a, le- a legend. And to be able to have said I played with him is amazing. Oh, that is amazing. All right. Next headline. Steve was born with an extra finger on his left hand. It's embarrassing, but it's false. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did make that one up. It would have been good for a puppeteer to have that. It might have been it was a working finger, huh? <laughs> yeah. I've made, actually made prosthetic fingers for people that had fingers missing. Is that true? That is. That is true. Yeah. A, a news reporter had a finger missing, and we made a mold of the finger on his right hand and placed it on his left hand so that when he did his his uh, news broadcast, he didn't have to hide his hand anymore. Oh, and it looked real. And was it workable at all? Well, it was just the end of his, end of his pinky finger. Oh. So it didn't have to work. It was, no, it was just glued on. Oh, that's terrific. But it looked real. <laughs> all right, next headline. Steve had his appendix removed twice. That's false. <laughs> Is it false? <laughs> It's false. I did not. I had to work on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so bizarre. You wanted it to be true, though. Yeah, I did. I really wanted it to be true, <laughs> and I wanted to hear the story about it. Because <laughs> I kind of figured, well, maybe someone removed something else that they shouldn't have. I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Just trying to be creative. Okay. All right. Next one, and this will be the last one. Uh, Steve was inspired to make bird puppets after a traumatic childhood incident. That's true. Oh, what was what was the incident? Or tell me more about that. It's sad. It's a scary story. But when I was a kid, 
there was another kid that was a bully in, a, in this playground experience who took a baby bird and smashed it in front of me underneath a teeter-totter. Oh. Smashed it down, and I was traumatized by that. I felt helpless and hopeless, victimized myself just having to watch that or seeing it happen in front of me so quickly that I've just been absolutely fixated on, on birds. And so I, I, love, I love making birds, and I never, I never forget that. I can't ever forget that was Fact Ooh. or something John just made up. Ah. You ready for some fan questions? Sure. Every time I interview somebody new, I put on my Facebook group that you can ask questions of my guest or ask me to ask questions awesome. of my guest. And here I am. All right, so Michael Worsham, a wonderful entertainer out of Maryland, says, uh, we approached this a little bit throughout the interview, um, ask Steve what Axtell has for entertainers who are not ventriloquists mm. but are interested in getting in, into puppets. Our first challenge with that was to come up with just soundtracks for people that were not ventriloquists. So we have a line of routines called X tracks, mm -hmm. A-X-T-R-A-X. And you can find those on our website. There's about 30 or 40 different routines that have script. They have a rehearsal track that you can listen to both voices on, the puppet and yourself. And I'm doing your part too. So I might say, how is your day going? Oh, my day is going just great. <laughs> And that would be the puppet character. And then on the performance track, you might hear music come in and then silence. Oh, that's just great. Thank you. You know, and then the character would come on. So you'd have a, a rehearsal track and then a performance track. And a lot of people use those. One of the most famous ones, if for the people that use the magic drawing board, is the Artomatic routine. Oh, and by the way, there are a lot of folks that I know personally that, that are not ventriloquists that use your stuff. I use the mic mouth. Yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of people use the off the meter yep. and my friend Tim Mannix uses the big baby. Yeah. <laughs> the big baby is crazy. It's this, uh, it looks like a baby carriage with a, with a baby's body in it and you put your head in it, right? Yes. It's a humanette is what, what the original back in vaudeville days, that was a humanette. You put a small body underneath somebody's face. <laughs> well, we did it under a baby bed. I saw that actually done by Sylvia Markson and she, uh, Fletcher, and she uh, had that interact, and we licensed that from her. So oh, it's, it's her concept, but we did put our own spin on it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Eddie Rice Jr., a clown, stilt walker, and man of many talents out of L.A., asks, <laughs> how do you find your staff, painter, puppet makers, electronics people, et cetera? We've been fortunate in a lot of our employees, like we'll bring in other people, people that they've seen, but sometimes they fall into our lap. We're getting a lot of requests now for people to work with us. So I've actually had Disney Imagineers stop by our shop off duty and say, hey, you got any openings? I would really love to work with you. So it's coming from all over. We're getting top level artists and craftsmen. The uh, tech department has John Schmeling, who's our animation manager, and he does all the tech support and stuff along with Wes Gonzalez, who assembles the animatronics. And then in our puppet production department, Jose Cruz manages a team of Teresa, Sandra, Mara Cruz, and Maria, and they assemble our puppets, glue them together, put all the furs together, airbrush the latex. In customer service, a lot of your uh, listeners will know Teresa Camarillo, and she takes care of the orders and shipping, any uh, customer service stuff that comes up. Also in our studio, we have a production studio with video and audio recordings and music production, and that's Greg Jackson, our producer. And then with engineering, I have Mel Beckman, Jeff Baker, Ron Grant, Derby Alston, Bill Palmer, Brett Bufford, a bunch of tech wizards that help me with the back end of stuff that I do. So yeah, a great team. Awesome. Peter Norgard, we know Peter Nor Norgard. He was the runner-up of Denmark's Got Talent. Absolutely. With one of your puppets. He told me that you converted one of your puppets into uh, a Tina Turner puppet for him. Yeah, that was our diva. Yep. Our diva puppet. Peter comes to CAX all the time. He comes from Denmark. Mm -hmm. He's a regular and phenomenal performer. 
What was his question? Oh, he's amazing. He was on episode 18 of The Variety Artist. He's incredible. His question, well, he has a few different questions. The first one, what are Steve's top three projects? Just give me one. Ah. What was one, one of your biggest projects? It's always the next one. Oh. So right now it's AI, right? Yep. We're getting into virtual reality. We're doing some stuff with virtual reality next. So both of those things have me captured right now. So that's, I'm always on the next thing. So, but the magic drawing board, is one of the projects that has, that's absolutely funded our company. We've sold over 50,000 magic drawing boards to date. Wow. Oh, another um, project that's really got us excited is live virtual sets. It's an invention that we've done where we have projected backgrounds and a performer with his puppets can stand in front of uh, the background and interact with it in such a way that you can go on journeys and tell stories. You can even open doors, walk upstairs, go into different rooms, and it all happens right behind them on this projected screen, which is you know only 10 feet wide or so, easy to set up. So we have produced uh, some of these for our customers, including our most recent Alice in Wonderland, and now we're doing a Peter Pan production for uh, Deluxe Puppets up in San Francisco. This is a really exciting thing. You can see videos on our website. All right, next question, also from Peter. Bonus question. Woo. What project kept him most up in the night? <laughs> wait, wait, is it the next one? I, I was up all night last night getting to an AI, you know. It just, uh, it never stops. It just, it's funny. If some of the stuff that is more technically challenging has to be, it's not just sculpting and then going to sleep and having a normal life. It's learning. Yeah, I've got a, so much learning to do on all of this stuff. So the research and, and then the ideas come in the middle of the night too. I'll wake up with a dream that as an answer to an idea happened many times. So some of them you wake up and you, you, you journal. Do you journal about it? I journal all the time. I have to get up and journal because, you know, you don't want to forget it. And then once I've done that, it's really hard to go back to sleep. <laughs> yeah, because all of a sudden, all these ideas are spinning around in your head. Yeah. Anybody that works with me regularly knows that they're going to get emails from me at three in the morning, two in the morning. It's no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. Once I get an idea in my head, I have to finish it. Yeah. And if I don't finish it, I'll think about it all day long. <laughs> it does help to kind of help you get it out of your head and onto the paper. Yeah. And I'm a paper guy. I, I do a ton with technology. but I don't find that I have the go back to history and it's too editable. So I don't get the mistakes. I don't get the learning curve. It's not documented. There's something to putting a pen on paper or a pencil on paper of getting it out of your system and, and, and working with it. And there's something about that instead of typing it into your computer. Absolutely. And I can go back to the very first thought I had about a subject and there it is. I'm sitting at lunchtime in uh, 1982 my, in my journal, I'm sitting there under a willow tree working at Camarillo State Hospital going, I have to do puppets this weekend at the fair, huh. and I'm going to draw caricatures with my old man puppet, but I wonder if I could make, and this is my notes, I wonder if I could make the drawing talk. Ah. Oh my gosh, the magic drawing board started to be born right there. So when you look at that, you go, gosh, 1982, that was 82 before you were born, dude. <laughs> that was actually, well, I won't say how old I was, but, but I was around in 82, believe me. <laughs> All right, we're going to go on to our last fan question from Pete Ellison. He's the owner and operator of One World Rhythm and an amazing musician. He asked, he's also a caxer. Oh, is he? Yeah. He's terrific. Very smart. Yep. What is your all-time favorite puppet character you have created? Wow, the next one. <laughs> um, so I have some favorites. One is really hard to pick out. I don't have one. One of the first big ones that took off for me was Vern the Bird. So many people have that because it was associated with the bird arm illusion. All right. A goofy character, yeah. I'd pick him out. Okay. They're kind of like your kids. Like, how do, you, how do you decide which one's your favorite? Can't do it. Yeah. yeah. The platypus has brought me the most money, let's say. Thanks to YouTube. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, for doing my podcast. You're awesome. This was great. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Before I let you go, where can they get a hold of you? If someone wants to order some of your, your items or just want to get a hold of you, period. 
axtel.com, A-X-T-E-L-L.com. And I'm Steve at axtel.com. Okay. And thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, tell a friend. That's how we can spread the word. Also, make sure to get your free audio book from audible.com. Just go to thevarietyartist.com slash book to get your free, uh, your first book for free. You can reach me at my email at john at thevarietyartist.com or join my Facebook group at The Variety Artist where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests like Steve. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight, and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.